Bob, how have you been coping with the pandemic? With difficulty, I think. Um, firstly, as you can see, I broke my bridge the day before lockdown. Did manage to get to the dentist, did make me a new one, but he's still not allowed to fit it. So I can't wait to go to the dentist for the first time in my life and yeah. speak properly. And, and apart from your teeth, and you sound, we can hear you, that's the main thing. Um, how else have you been coping with it? Um, well, I've been doing a lot of walking, actually. And, um, you know, basically I live on the edge of the gallop, so I'm not breaking, I haven't been breaking any rules. It's my garden. And um, I suppose I walk over 10, 12 miles a day just walking round and round. Well, we've got 3,000 acres of gallops about. So I've been very, very lucky. Thankfully, I haven't been living in a big city where they can't get out. So I have been very fortunate, but um, did have a game of golf yesterday. For the first time, I've left Newmarket in nine weeks. <laughs> well, did you play very well? That's the, that's the question. I played desperate. Tom will beat me. <laughs> Derek Thompson, who was your... Yeah. Man at, uh, at your wedding so yeah. we'll come back to that wedding in a moment because it's an interesting story but how do you feel about racing behind closed doors um well uh, racing has got to get back let's be honest you know i don't know about racing behind closed doors you know because um there's going to be more security than people there um but you know the horses are ready to run i've been on the gallops every morning and they are revving them up and getting them ready. But, you know, I see the first day at Newcastle has got about 300, 350 entries. So, <laughs> God, there's got to be a lot balloted out. It's yeah. going to be hard to get a runner in the first two or three weeks, I think. But um, hopefully we're going to come out of lockdown sooner than later, actually. Things that are looking a little bit better. But, you know, I can't wait to go racing. Um, I won't be allowed to go until... Um, everybody can go. So, you know, I'm missing it. And I live, you know, virtually on the Roly Mile. Now, um, the interesting thing about football, I've been watching this German stuff and, and it's dead without a crowd there. Most of horse racing is actually away from the grandstand and away from on the crowds. It may not look quite as bad in racing. What do you think? I think it might look as bad, but, um, you know, people like going to the paddock and looking at the horses going to the bar and having a drink, uh, going in the stands and watching, like watching the horses come back um, in the unsaddling enclosure. You know, it is going to be a little bit dead there, um, but it's a big business and um, horses are in training to run. And, you know, I feel sorry uh, for the owners in particular because at the moment they're not allowed to go either. So um, they'll have to sit at home and watch it on the TV. Now, Aintree's played a big part in your life. Just first of all, tell me about your involvement with Event Masters and Aintree. Which um, well, Event Masters, out. Event Masters have always been good to me, actually, and um, I do go and walk some of their clients around the course and um, try to give a few tips uh, for the day's racing. They do a fantastic job. They give the people a great day out. I must admit. The good news is that your book for. Next Yes, Grand National for Event Masters. The bad news, of course, you missed this year because of the uh, virus. But uh, it'd be good to see you back in action at Aintree. Oh, I can't wait to get back up there. You know, I think that's the um, first national I've missed in about the last 50 years. And, um, you know, you know, from the, the very first ride I had in the um, Chris Red Rum National, basically, that was the first time I got round and finished fifth or sixth. Um, that was the greatest uh, achievement, I thought, for myself at that time, you know. After that day, of course, I wanted to win one. Yeah. And now, how many rides um, before Alderneity did you have in the Grand National? He was my 10th ride. 10th ride. And um, I did have 11 in all. Um, I got round five or six times, so my record wasn't too bad there. And three of them fell at the first. And um, one at... Um, Beaches on a horse called Purdo. I was going very well at the time. Um, maybe I could have won. I don't know. Went to, too far out to know. Well, let's talk about the big year for two reasons. One, it's always worth recalling 1981 Grand National. And B, there will be youngsters who won't be as aware about it as we were. So it's worth going over again. Now, just to set the scene, 1980. 
one Grand National. You developed cancer in uh, 1979 and, and your lifespan appeared limited. The horse Aldeniti broke down twice, bad injuries. The vet recommended that Aldeniti be put down, but he wasn't. First of all, let's talk about you. Um, what happened in July 1979? Well, basically, I was in America and um, I used to spend every summer in the States because there was no racing in England and I used to get a few rides out there and I was fortunate I rode a few winners out there and it kept me fit, it kept my weight down and I'd been going there for about three years before and I'd had kicks, falls like every jockey every year and um, I had this numb feeling um, in my testicles but I still didn't do anything about it and um, went to America and, you know, basically I started going out with a vet, a lady vet, let's be honest. And um, she was the one that told me if I was you, I'd get on the first plane back to England and see a specialist. She put the fear of God in me, I promise you. I got on the first plane back and landed, rang a doctor up in the Park Street Clinic in London who used to patch us jockeys up uh, those days, Michael Turner. And, um, you know, basically he told me what was wrong with me on the telephone. And he said, ring me back in 10 minutes and I'll have an appointment at the Royal Marsden Hospital. And, you know, tootled along there after lunch. And um, basically within the week I'd had two operations. And, um, you know, then they had all the results and they gave me two choices, actually. They told me I had a 30% chance of living with treatment or live four or five months without treatment and die. So really, I didn't know what to do because 30% didn't sound great odds those days. But um, the Professor Peckham um, knew I was involved in racing and he just said to me, if, I, if you were on a six to four shot in a novice chase, would you take the ride? And that's how he talked me into having the treatment. After that, the treatment those days was barbaric, I promise you. Uh, been blasting platinum, bleomycin pumped into you every day for seven days. Uh, went back on the 10th day um, for more treatment, a couple more days off, another one. And then the 21st day, start the treatment again. That went on for seven months, I suppose and um, nearly died of septicemia a couple of times. But, you know, January the 1st was my last treatment. And I thought, what a way to start the year, uh, 1980. Not a very good 79 with the illness. Hopefully things to look forward to. And um, I remember I sat on a horse about three weeks later. I was so weak, I was pathetic. And... Um, and I thought, well, I'm never going to make it back. I, you know, I was so weak. I'd lost so much weight. I went down to about eight stone. Well, I'd never been eight stones from the day I was born. So um, I thought maybe I'll make a flat jockey. But um, things were hard. And then I thought the weather here is desperate in England. It's very cold. My lungs have been damaged. Um, I'll go back to America. Burley Cox's horses would be in South Carolina that time of year. Weather would be warm, tootled off there. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I haven't got the virus. Um, went down there and um, started riding out. Nice weather, I could breathe a little bit easier. And um, I remember May the 1st came round and did my first silly thing. Jumped on the scales, 12 stone 7. God right. knows how I put all that weight on in that time. And I was riding out an awful lot and running and everything. That was May the 1st. I had a ride May the 31st, managed to take off two stone. And the first ride back was in a flat race over there, like our type of bumpers, yeah. um, but not bumper horses. I was on a stake horse called Double Reef. It went and won. I, to me, that was a great day. But looking back on it, it should have won. I was on the best horse in the race. But the thing that pleased me more than anything was I hadn't lost my racing brain. And that meant an awful lot to me. <coughs> so, so that's your situation. Let's go to Alderniti, who had some terrible injuries. And 
after the second one, I think the vet said this horse has to be put down, has to be put to sleep. Why wasn't it? Um, well, there's two reasons. Was about, he broke down about four times, actually. That yep. was the fourth time. Um, kept having all these problems, kept coming back and seemed to win first time. And one day when I won on him at uh, Leicester, the Silver Fox there, I got off him and said he'll win a Grand National one day to the owners. And that must have stayed in their uh, mind when he broke down that day so badly at Sandown. The vets did want to put him down. And um, thankfully, Mr. and Mrs. Embricos said no. Um, basically, Bob said he'll win a Grand National one day. But the horse, he was a terrific patient. He stood in his box for over six months in plaster, tied up, couldn't move. What a patient he must have been. Absolutely amazing. And he came out of the, the box. The Embricoses did all the road work with him. He arrived back at Josh Gifford's January the 1st, 1981, um, done all the road work. He was a horse that used to pull very hard and Josh had hands like silk. So he rode him out every day. And I'm sure if Josh hadn't ridden him every day, he never would have got back to the race course. And um, February the 13th came around. The Whitbread trial at Ascot, Old Daniti came back to the track and absolutely bolted up that day. And I can remember he was 66 to one for the national that morning of the race. And thankfully the owners had a few quid on him and he was 12 to one for the Whitbread trial that day. And duly obliged as he went by the uh, winning post, Ladbrokes made him um, 12 to one second favorite for the national. So the team had a few quid on. So, we get to April the 4th, 1981, he's 10-1, to 1 and it's good conditions. Did you actually think before the race that you would win it? I, for the previous three weeks, I thought it was a certainty. Uh, my da main danger for me was the ground was a little bit soft in places and very tacky. And um, so I walked the course a couple of times in the morning and kept looking where the best ground was. And I thought, well, well, Josh did as well, said basically go down the outer to beaches and, you know, keep to the outer. And, but I must have had the best run around the canal turn that anybody's had the history of racing because I jumped beaches about 29th, three fences later, which is three and a half miles from home, I jumped to the front. And um, I'm thinking, I'm in the stands getting a right rollick in here, supposed to be holding him up. But kept looking through um, previous nationals in my brain, Red Rums 5, kept having these excuses. But when I'd walked the course in the morning, there was about four foot of really good ground right on the inner. I got across to that good ground. I never left it one iota and just kept jumping better than anything else in the race. Got to the last fence in front, thought I'm the right place, the right time. Went and won the race. Um, absolutely fantastic feeling. Um, but, you know, I can remember going back into the weighing room, did all the TV press interviews. Nearly forgot I'd arrived in a race an hour later and one Josh really fancied. I got beat on that. So I got me rollicking very quickly. <laughs> He brought me down to earth very quick. I do appreciate that. <laughs> Let's just go back to the closing stages because when you got to the elbow, that's the run in. And then this is so far, the Grand National, so many jumps. Um, Spartan Missile, uh, ridden by 54 year old amateur John Thorne, his grandfather as well at the time, uh, eight to one favourite. Were you aware that he was closing on you? Um, I wasn't aware it was um, Spartan Missile. I knew something was closing. Um, I saw Royal Mail, who finished third, three yeah. out. And I thought, well, I'm going better than him. And, um, you know, jumped the um, last fence. And I thought, well, I've got to keep holding him together because this horse has got legs like glass, actually. So don't get carried away. I knew he'd keep galloping. Um and I just thought, got to the elbow, and I just sensed this horse come to my quarters, actually, and um, thought, well, 
you know, just give him one slap because Josh didn't like the stick. I only hit him the once in the race. And um, he just lengthened his stride and started going away. It wasn't until um, I got back in the weighing room, actually, I knew John had finished um, second to me. And But John was the first person to congratulate me when I pulled up. But, you know, your mind's in such a buzz and you're just thinking, you know, about the race in a lot of ways. And, and the most important thing was don't forget to weigh in. And that's <laughs> the most important thing. And that kept going through my brain. Thankfully, oh. Josh, as I got off, walked away, he said, don't forget to weigh in. I, I also uh, have seen a quote from you where when you crossed the finishing line as a winner, you were thinking about people in hospital. That is true, actually. When I went by, it, the hospital scene, as you saw in the film, actually, did come into my mind. You know, it took me back uh, for just a few seconds um, back to the hospital, lying in bed, being sick with the chemotherapy. And the thing I suppose that brought it on was um, that day, the sister and staff nurse, uh, we got them tickets to come up to the race. Um, they were absolutely terrific to me all the time. And having them there meant an awful lot. And I suppose that was one of the reasons I thought that when I pulled up. Now, all sorts of things happened after that. I mean, winning the Grand National um, was even more important in those days than it is now. Uh, and, and the first thing that happened uh, was that you, you got married later that year to Joe. And uh, Derek Thompson was your best man. And as you came out of the church, there was Eamon Andrews with a book, a red book, a famous red book. This is your life in those days. Yes, he was there. It was a bit of a shock, I promise you. <laughs> I wondered why nobody spoke to me for three weeks before. <laughs> I thought I was a pauper or whatever was wrong with me. I had a virus. I don't know why. But nobody actually spoke to me. And when I came out of the church, I was absolutely just shocked, godsmacked, really. But, you know, the guests came over. The thing that meant the most to me, for having, fair enough, having mum and dad and my sister there, but um, Burley Cox and his wife came all over, all the way over from America to be there, to be on the programme. And that meant an awful lot to me because I owed them an awful lot for how they looked after me and gave me a chance over in the States and my comeback. You're obviously aware of the tremendous emotion through... Uh... The country and, and the late Josh Gifford, your, your trainer, I remember doing a, a Sky Sports This Is um, uh, program with you, Nick, the owner, and him. And, and when we talked about it, he cried. Time of our lives. Yeah, Josh. Josh was always quite emotional, actually. Um, but, you know, this day, you know, basically, he was in tears, you know. He realised it was a great day for me, great day for the owner, great day for the horse. They put everything into it and um, to get him there that day. And um, it wasn't the easiest thing. And I can remember about three days before the National, um, the foot and mouth came about in the Sussex area. Yeah. And Josh got a phone call at midnight from the Sussex police. You've got to get this horse out by five o'clock this morning. That was two days before he was meant to leave. If we hadn't had the police, I don't think on our side, I don't think we'd have got him out. Amazing. So you've got um, This Is Your Life and then uh, with starring John Hurt, the famous film Champions, John Hurt playing you. Um, you're obviously involved in the film. Um, and that was a really good film actually. It told the story brilliantly, I thought. I think they did a fantastic job. Um, having John Hurt play me, absolutely brilliant actor, a great man as well, liked his racing. And people don't realise he did quite a lot of the riding in the film. Terry Biddlecombe taught him an awful lot, helped him. He wasn't allowed to jump anything because of the insurance and everything. But, you know, he rode the finish. He did a hell of a lot in it. I felt he did a great job and... You know, Edward Woodward, Jan Francis, Ben Johnson, Alison Steadman, every time you stick the TV on, she's on something. Um, you know, they all did well. Kirsty Alley, of course. Yes. No, it was, it was a very good film. And in between, uh, in the uh, Queen's Birthday Honours list, you've got an MBE as well. Trip to yeah. That was a very proud moment, actually. You know, um, 
you know, I never thought I'd ever get anything like that. And, um, you know, Her Majesty did give it to me, actually. And, um, you know, basically she was talking about racing, actually, to me. I must have been with her over a minute, which is a long time in those yeah. um, things. And, um, you know, basically she loves her racing, actually. I have been fortunate to have met her quite a few times, but, you know, she's been fantastic for all types of national hunt racing and the flat, of course, which she breeds an awful lot of winners. And then a really important thing, Bob, um, the Bob Champion Cancer Trust, which is still going strong. First of all, um, the last amount I saw, and I know you'll update me, you've raised £15 million into cancer research uh, and spin-offs from that. Uh, have you got an updated? Well, we, we're over 15 million out yeah, of the um, yeah. precise total. You know, no, but it's over 15. Our money's going out into the research centres. We've got the two research centres. We fund um, an awful lot of research into it. And we're getting success, which is the main thing. They're even looking into this virus, I think, I read somewhere. Yes, um, our team, our unit, yeah. has been looking into it. We've I don't know how many scientists we took off our projects to look into this. Um, so basically, people who have supported us uh, have supported the virus as well. Um, you must be very proud of this. I mean, I'm proud of you for doing it, but you must be very proud. I, I suppose, of course, I'm very proud. But the thing I'm the most proud of is all the people that have given money to my cancer trust, care of me in a way, and, um, you know, I know it's done a fantastic job and still is doing a fantastic job and always will. And, you know, but uh, research still costs a lot of money. And um, we do employ very, very good scientists. And, um, you know, we just don't pick, go down to the job centre. Professor Colin Cooper, you know, knows what he wants and um, basically he gets the people he wants. If people wanted to make a donation, and I'm sure people watching this will, will want to contribute because it's so fantastic, what do they do? Is it it's the website, isn't there? Just look on the um, website, look under Bob Champion anyway, bobchampion.org yes. or bobchampion.co.uk. Yes. Any Bob Champion, they'll put you through to it. Yeah. And you've also brought out another autobiography, I think. Um, I'm a champion, what was it? Uh, I'm, champ I'm champion, call me Bob. Yeah, call me Bob. Um, very good. Now, June the 4th, 19, uh, sorry, June the 4th, 2020, you are 72. How do you feel? Um, well, the walking I've been doing lately, I've been pretty fit, actually. Um, you know, I think when this is all over, I'll walk a thousand miles. Yeah. <laughs> so no after effects from all those years ago. No, God, good God, yeah, I get back problems and everything, um, always have had. Um, you know, it's hard. This weather absolutely suits me, actually. The aches and pains aren't as bad, but cold, damp days. Um, some mornings I'm quite a lot of pain, but, um, you know, that's part of the job. I'm lucky. I got out in one piece. A lot of other jockeys didn't. Yes, and we're glad that you got out in one piece. Um, finally, Bob. Aldeniti, Bob Champion, Grand National winners, 39 years ago as we talk now. Um, people still, like myself, I'm doing it now, but people still recalling it to you and still talk about it? I know they do. I can't believe it, actually. Um, you know, um, you know, people are getting older as well. I don't suppose that many of the young people have ever heard of me, but... Um, People, you know, our era and earlier have been very, very good. And um, I think they enjoy it. And the BBC keeps showing it. And um, and the music from the film is absolutely fantastic, Carl Davis. And I think, well, ITV use it as well. So um, that means a lot to me, actually, and Carl. <laughs> well done, Bob. Thank you very much for this chat. Thank you very much. Have a good day.